On the night of July 3rd, 1970, the largest military engagement in Ireland since the Easter Rising of 1916 took place. For nearly eight hours, from around 8pm until perhaps 4am, a fierce gun battle raged in the small tire streets of the Lower Falls in Belfast. The area had been placed under an illegal curfew by 10pm by the British Army, which was determined to disarm the heartland of republicanism in Belfast. 3,000 troops, surrounded by armoured cars and helicopters, surrounded the small area and began to force their way into it. They met heavy resistance from the local population, led by D Company of the Belfast Command, official Irish Republican Army. The trigger for the incident that led to the false curfew was a phone call on Friday, July the 3rd, 1970, from an upset woman to the RUC reporting that there were arms and explosives in 24 Balkan Street. It was quite clear to the British at the time who their opponents during the curfew were. In the words of Captain Charters, an intelligence officer of C Company, 1st Battalion Royal Scots, stationed at Har Street. The chappies with the Black Berries and James Connolly badges did all the fighting last Friday night. That is, the IRA, the officials, the stickies. Welcome to the 50th anniversary of the curfew that took place in the Lower Falls between the 3rd and the 5th of July in 1970. The curfew was the biggest engagement between armed Irish Republicans and the British Army since 1916. The British deployed over 3,000 troops uh, from various regiments, the lifeguards, the Royal Scots, the Black Watch, uh, the Gloucesters and the Duke of Edinburgh's Royal Regiment. They were armed with light tanks, armoured cars, heavy machine guns, self-loading rifles and CS gas against the Fianna Aaron coming them on in the IRA unit on the Falls Road. And the ending to that battle was a foregone conclusion. Um, the British were ruthless aggressors. They murdered four people, wounded 35, and arrested 335 people. And justice has never really been done for the working class who died that weekend. And the outrage for that atrocity is still as strong now as it was 50 years ago. It has become one of the most iconic incidents of the Troubles. Everyone wants to say, I was there, including the provost. The IRA under Billy McMillan and Jimmy Sullivan can hold their heads high with pride. They were there. Brenton Cuse, who was a high-ranking provisional, said in a statement to Ed Maloney in Voices from the Grave, We were there, we threw two blast bombs, had a five or six minute gun battle, and then hunkered down to sit it out. Billy McKee, who was a leading provisional in Belfast, uh, in an interview uh, with a, a leading Republican, stated that he hoped the British Army would have wiped out the IRA, which meant the officials in his terminology, uh, in the falls, and would thereby leave the provisionals as the only opposition to the British. Uh, that attitude deepened the enmity, enmity between the IRA and the provisionals that has lasted for generations. The IRA under Billy McMillan fought the battle alone. The curfew was finally broken by the courage of thousands of women from many areas of Belfast who marched to the barbed wire barricades and overturned them, sometimes fighting British troops to get in as at, at Sultan Street and the top of Leeson Street. And they displayed tremendous courage and are legendary in this part uh, of the Lower Falls. Uh, so some of the impacts of the curfew for us as Republicans uh, were fairly clear. For example, the relatives of Paddy Alleyman, who was one of those murdered, was visited by the REC two days after the curfew. They asked the family to come to the station to make a statement, which they did. After writing a two-page statement identifying the regiment responsible for his murder, they were told they would be contacted shortly. They never heard from the REC again. The fact that the RUC made no real attempt to investigate the murders led directly to the massacres in Billy Murphy in August 1971 when 11 civilians were murdered, Spring Hill in 1972 when five civilians were murdered and Bloody Sunday in Derry in 1972 when 14 civilians were murdered. The pattern of state murder was actually set by the curfew. The British Army and the state forces effectively became immune from prosecution for the murder of Irish civilians. 
1969, the RUC machine gun to Falls Road with Shoreland armoured cars, killing nine-year-old Paddy Rooney uh, and Q McCabe. No police were ever charged with those killings, and not one soldier has ever spent an hour in prison for any of the murders that were committed in any of these massacres. So immunity was one of the uh, impacts of the curfew. The other impact was whatever role the arrival of British troops had on the streets of Belfast and Derry in 1969, the sheer brutality of the British Army during the curfew sowed the seeds of decades of violence for us. Working class Catholics became alienated from the state and its armed representatives. People who had never been Republicans joined the paramilitaries, especially the provost. Many of those sought revenge for 1969 and now the massacre uh, in the falls. The curfew had effectively become the first recruiting agent for paramilitary groups. And it was at the behest of the state and the unionists that that happened. The British brutality during the curfew and indeed afterwards displayed uh, a colonial mentality in Northern Ireland which viewed us as simply another field for similar operations that they had run previously in Malaya, Kenya, Aden uh, and Cyprus. And this clearly identified Catholics as a suspect population, which required special laws and army camps, positioned in the very heart of local communities to maintain control. Um, hence, during internment, land that had been reserved for local businesses in the White Rock GAA pitches in Cross McLean, local factories in Andersonstown were commandeered and occupied by the British Army. Similar tactics were used by the Americans in Vietnam during their occupation there. The curfew for us amplified the opinion that Northern Ireland was not reformable and that undermined the credibility of the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association, which was such a, a, a plank of Republican ideology. Um, and that whole uh, idea of reform was later dealt a death blow by the events of Bloody Sunday. Never since has a civil rights march been seen on the streets of Northern Ireland. And that also suited the provisionals because no one was now arguing for reform of the state. Um, it also totally undermined the ideology that was created by the likes of Golding, uh, Sean Garland and Billy McMillan and all the Republicans who throughout the 1960s uh, had developed and renewed the Republican movement uh, and its understanding that physical force politics um, had failed to establish an Irish Republic in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and the provisional campaign has also failed to achieve that objective. Um, today, Sinn Féin simply administer Northern Ireland as part of a partitionist uh, a state under British rule. The civil rights campaign had disarmed the RUC, disbanded the B specials, reformed housing allocation, introduced uh, one person, one vote, and ended gerrymandering. The provisionals campaign, uh, after the curfew, re established an armed police force, the establishment of a police reserve, the UDR, and destroyed any prospect of working class unity or a united Ireland in our lifetime. So the curfew essentially established the credibility of the provisional IRA uh, and ensured decades of violence after that. So in some senses, when we ask, why should we remember the curfew? I mean, if we're sensitive to the relationship between culture and commemoration, it creates a space for actually thinking about the manner in which you can commemorate events in a very positive way. Uh, and if we don't think about and learn about uh, the past, uh, and our place in it, and we can easily repeat uh, what happened. So it's not a time for us to honour conflict, and that's not what you do when you commemorate the curfew. Conflict isn't something to be honoured, although some might say that as a, a nation, uh, we do honour violence when we're celebrating 1798 or 1916. The false curfew, for me, uh, and for many others, was a momentous event in modern Irish history. It's something that distinguished us from other people, Irish Republicans, from violent sectarian nationalists. Uh, it also set disastrous historical precedents, immunity for murder uh, from the state and its armed forces. 
Um, it acted as a recruiting agent for paramilitaries, uh, especially the provost, uh, who into their ranks flapped nationalists, Catholics, Glasgow Celtic supporters, uh, in order to get revenge for 69 and they for the curfew. And it also, in the aftermath, uh, drove the Civil Rights Association off the streets. And I think those are things which we, as a party, those are things which we, as a community, should remember and learn from. And I think that's what we're doing. So I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to actually um, watch uh, this video. Uh, because I think it's important that we all still remember what happened to us as a community uh, in the 1970s.